So this is the way democracy dies with thunderous applause. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful. So beautiful. Chi- <laughs> China. Hello and welcome to the 18th episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon Reading Group series. Today is Thursday, 10th of December 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. We continue on our merry way through Chapter 5, the National Assembly vs Bonaparte and wrap up with a couple of my favourite jokes. This week I have the new patron Cucumbers and the return of my very first patron, Senen Kerr, to thank. You too can help keep the good ship Alpha afloat by heading over to Patreon and throwing me a few bob. There is loads of extra episodes and live streams to be had. The votes have just been tallied for the winner of the next Reading Group series. And lo and behold, it's last year's runner-up, Understanding Class, by Eric Olin Wright, with 42 votes. So now is the time to buy yourself a nice copy of it for Christmas and get your reading glasses on. We're planning to start the recording of it in early January. Okay, let's head back to the discussion. We have seen how on great and striking occasions during the months of November and December, the National Assembly avoided or quashed the struggle with the executive power. Now we see it compelled to take up the struggle on the pettiest occasions. In the Monian affair, it confirms the principle of imprisoning people's representatives for debt, but reserves the right to have it applied only to representatives obnoxious to itself and wrangles over this infamous privilege with the Minister of Justice. Instead of availing itself of the alleged murder plot to decree an inquiry into the Society of December 10, and irredeemably unmasking Bonaparte before France and Europe in his true character of chief of the Paris lumpen proletariat, it lets the conflict be degraded to a point where the only issue between it and the Minister of the Interior is which of them has the authority to appoint and dismiss a police commissioner. Thus, during the whole of this period, we see the party of order compelled by its equivocal position to dissipate and disintegrate its struggle with the executive power in petty jurisdictional squabbles, petty foggery, legalistic hair-splitting, and to make the most ridiculous matter of form the substance of its activity. It does not dare take up the conflict at the moment when this has significance from the standpoint of principle. When the executive power, ha- when the executive power has really exposed itself, and the cause of the National Assembly would be the cause of the nation. By so doing, it would give the nation its marching orders, and it fears nothing more than the nation should move. On such occasions, it accordingly rejects the notions of the Montagne and proceeds to the order of the day. The question at issue, in its large aspects having thus been dropped, the executive power calmly waits for the time when it can again take up the same question on petty and insignificant occasions, when this is, so to speak, of only local parliamentary interests. Then the repressed rage of the party of order breaks out, then it tears the current away from the Colosses, then it denounces the president, then it declares the republic in danger, but then also its fervor appears absurd and the occasion for the struggle seems a hypocritical pretext or altogether not worth fighting about. The parliamentary storm becomes a storm in a teacup. The fight becomes an intrigue, the conflict a a scandal. While the revolutionary classes gloat with malicious joy over the humiliation of the National Assembly, for they are just as enthusiastic about the parliamentary prerogatives of this assembly as the latter is about the public liberties the bourgeoisie outside the parliament does not understand how the bourgeoisie inside the parliament can waste time over such petty squabbles and imperial tranquility by such pitiful rivalries with the president. It becomes confused by a strategy that makes peace 
at the moment when all the world is expecting battles and attacks at the moment when all the world believes peace has been made. Okay, two things I'd like to say here. Russia Gate, number one. And number two is Nancy Pelosi ripping up Trump's speech after giving him like oh. an increased military budget and spying budget, domestic spying yeah. budget. But I feel like people fall for that shit. Well, I, I, people or politically engaged. I don't want to say they're not people. I'm just saying they're they're not, not people. They're not people. <laughs> I'll let Tom say it. But all I was saying is that that's the general population. They're more credulous towards reality TV than to that shit. Right. They know that that's bullshit. And then they might think that professional wrestling's, you know, might be legit at the same time. And you know what? <laughs> like, they're like, that's, that's legitimate. Like professional wrestling actually has more nicks and cuts and bruises than politics. Agreed. I just found this paragraph well, uh, like totally descriptive of current American politics to an amazing extent. Yeah. Uh, it's, yeah. It's fucking pathetic. It, Pelosi is a petty fogger if I've ever seen one. <laughs> if I had ever written anything like this for school, they would fail me. I <laughs> 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 would get a failing like a grade. Science program? Yeah, they would fail me. I would get a failing grade if I ever wrote something like this. <laughs> they would they would just go F. Like they would see they would read the first paragraph and give me an F. Like, what branch of biology do you study? Am I wrong? Chemistry. It's chemistry. Physical chemistry. Yeah. Damn it. Okay, yeah. so yeah. If, if you have this much rage about, like, something in chemistry, I, I would wonder. No, but it's like, it's so, like, has so many adjectives and, like, so many parliamentary swell becomes a storm in a teacup. Similes. Similes and shit like that. Yeah. A metaphor. Yeah yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, all this, like... Do you yeah, not like I mean, that? You just like reading fucking binary codes. You're not allowed to speak anymore. Let's fucking you. <laughs> this is really They're fucking sick well birds. They're sick birds. Yeah, <laughs> they, no, th this is what's known as dunking. You might fail in college writing if you write like this, but on Twitter, damn, you get like six figure followers, baby. Seriously, this is like the Chomsky school of fucking political discussion Puya is from. You know, you have to you have to basically say all your fucking political points in like uh, analytic philosophy style. Jesus Christ! Oh, who yeah, you? you're well, you're who banned can, who from can, now on. You're on personal <laughs> space, right? Have, have you but like, who can who can even understand this? I can. Jesus, yeah, I know, hard. I know. But like, you have to like sit down and like and like <laughs> and read it. Puya, Puya, yeah. this, Puya, you have to remember. <laughs> Oh my god. This is this is the era where people like Dickens are writing novels, you know. Well, this is pre-Dickens, I guess, but it's it's this like better you know, than people Dickens people had people had an appetite for lots of text at this point in time. There was is all I'm TV. saying. That's why. <laughs> yeah, yeah, seriously they, they like the what is what is the, the he used some ridiculous word petty foggery that's just an old fashioned word like fucking yeah, yeah. hell like seriously I'm bringing like, it back this is brilliant writing I don't give a shit what anybody says that's just like you've been reading fucking chemistry papers and now you come here <laughs> giving out about this fucking like masterpiece of historical writing my god <laughs> Kill the fucking engineers kill all the engineers no no <laughs> Derek was here uh, he'd uh Child and dead soldier, you know? I'm the soldier defending Puya here. I can't believe this is happening. And Derek isn't even here. Jesus Christ. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Puya Defender has logged on. Yeah, Puya Defender has logged on. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. <laughs> I've, got, I've, got, I've got my back up. Got the gang. Yeah. <laughs> So if, if this was if this was written in modern writing, it would be broken up into like six paragraphs. <laughs> but it's still damn good writing. Is all I'm going to yeah, say about it. I yeah. Agree. Not only that, but he is able to do it all in one sentence. <laughs> I'm gonna like defend me a little bit here, though. I think this is a good this is good writing. It's a good middle ground between like my APA style or reading like bio textbooks versus something like EndNotes, which I brought up earlier as like a joke, but really like, I realize I don't hate communization that much. I hate their writing style. 
it makes me want to pull my fucking hair out because I learned to write in APA and I wrote like honors papers and shit like that for them. And it's too, you get to the fucking point with that. Where yeah, right. Like with, with EndNotes <laughs> and that kind of style of writing, like it's very flowery and poetic and kind of influenced by Althusser. And I just want to like take it out back and shoot it with my gun. So we're going to go on to the next part. We're going to skip a little bit here where he talks about how he set up a really dodgy lottery where he printed like 20 times the number of tickets. This was what Bonaparte did to get some more cash and how he promised to set up some workhouses. And, you know, he did that trick that all rich Western countries do where they pledge a certain amount of charity money to a disaster case and then give like a tenth of what they actually pledged. So at this point here, then we're going to get to what happens in the National Assembly about all of this. Do you want to read this bit? I'm ready to you flex see? my audiobook voice. Here, the National Assembly was confronted not with the fictitious president of the Republic, but with Bonaparte in the flesh. Here, it could catch him in the act, in conflict not with the Constitution, but with the code penal, with the penal code. If after Dupras' interpolation, it proceeded to the order of the day. This had not happened merely because Girardin's motion that it should declare itself satisfied reminded the party of order of its own systematic corruption. The bourgeois and above all the bourgeois inflated into a statesman supplements his practical meanness by theoretical extravagance. As a statesman, he becomes like the state power that confronts him, a higher being that can be fought only in a higher consecrated fashion. Bonaparte, who precisely because he was a Bohemian, a princely lumpen proletarian, had the advantage over a rascally bourgeois and that he could conduct the struggle meanly, now saw after the assembly guided him with its own hand across the slippery ground of the military banquets, the reviews, the society of December 10th, and finally the code penal, that the moment had come when he could pass from an apparent defensive to the offensive. The minor defeats, meanwhile, sustained by the Minister of Justice, the Minister of War, the Minister of the Navy, and the Minister of Finance, through which the National Assembly signified its snarling displeasure, troubled him little. He not only prevented the ministers from resigning and thus recognizing the sovereignty of Parliament over the executive power, but could now consummate what he had begun during the recess of the National Assembly, the severance of the military power from Parliament, the removal of Jean Garnier. An Elysee paper published an order of the day alleged to have been addressed during the month of May to the First Army Division, and therefore proceeding from Jean Garnier, in which the officers were urged, in the event of an insurrection, to give no quarter to the traitors in their ranks, but to shoot them immediately and to refuse troops to the National Assembly if it should requisition them. On January 3rd, 1851, the cabinet was interpolated concerning this order of the day. For the investigation of this matter, it requests a breathing space, first of three months, then of a week, finally of only 24 hours. The assembly insists on an immediate explanation. Jean Garnier rises and declares that there was never such an order of the day. He adds that he will always hasten to comply with the demands of the National Assembly and that in case of a clash, it can count on him. It receives his declaration with indescribable applause and passes a vote of confidence in him. It abdicates, it decrees its own impotence and the omnipotence of the army by placing itself under the private protection of a general. But the general deceives himself when he puts at his command against Bonaparte a power that he holds only as a fief from the same Bonaparte. And when, in his turn, he expects to be protected by this parliament, his own protege, in need of protection. Jean Garnier, however, believes in the mysterious power with which the bourgeoisie has endowed him since January 29th, 1849. He considers himself the third power existing side by side with both the other state powers. He shares the fate of the rest of this epoch's heroes, or rather saints, whose greatness consists precisely in the biased great opinion of them that their party creates in its own interests and who shrink to everyday figures as soon as circumstances call upon them to perform miracles. Unbelief is, in general, the mortal enemy of these reputed heroes who are really saints. 
Hence, their majestically moral indignation at the dearth of enthusiasm displayed by wits and scoffers. Well, there's a lot of goddamn shade being thrown in these two paragraphs. <laughs> Kyle, you normally like to talk about the snarky McCullens. What do you got to say oh, about this? It's wonderful. It's so good. I think I think maybe the the sort of connotations of saints comes out differently in a different uh, language or culture. It it maybe doesn't hit quite as hard, but you can kind of imagine that opposition between heroes who can actually get shit done and saints who are just there as like you know kind of like moral figures who are martyred or or call upon miracles. So it, it, it's really good. I love this idea of this sort of heightened opinion that the bourgeois has of themselves when they enter into government and become states people, right? I feel like this idea of the bourgeois states person as being an intellectual is somewhat dated, but that kind of aura of office that Marx is pointing at is nevertheless still very much there. It's like, um, you know, you've got Thatcherism, you've got Reaganism, you've got Trumpism, you've got, you know, they put an ism on someone's name when they've got no no thought, that, that a new thought that ever entered any of their heads. But I, I would say that. Yeah, I well, but I, I, will, I will just like clarify what I meant there is that you have people in the party of order who are like legitimate intellectuals and are writing like groundbreaking treaties. They're not simply political hacks, but that that's what I mean when they, when I'm talking about the theoretical extravagance being somewhat a dated concept, like you just don't have that anymore. Yeah, definitely. And I think that's a function of like, this was like the, we're in the times here of the bourgeois revolutions where they, the, the revolutions and the political forces at work, they need their higher philosophical treaties to give them power, to give them strength and support. What we have now is like this, we, we've talked about decadent theory, I think last week, but like you have these, it's like a lot of Roman senators sitting around a vomitorium. <laughs> that, that, that's what our parliaments are like. That's what the right wing parliament, the right wing parties in like the modern democratic countries are like they, if anything, it's nearly the far right have more actual theoretical work at this stage. Yeah, like the, the closest thing we had in Canada was like in recent history was Michael Ignatieff, who was kind of like a, a sort of popular intellectual, like a, a neoliberal hawkish hack who really played up his aristocratic background in, in the, the Russian aristocracy and became the leader of the Liberal Party and was just like a catastrophically bad politician and quickly was given the boot for the politicos to take power once again. Honestly, the thing it, it really reminds me of is Obama. You know, like Obama's going to be this great figure. He's going to do all this stuff. And then when he finally gets into office, even with the supermajority, he can't get through his major campaign promise. Or doesn't want to. I think it was just for the campaigning. I don't think he was, he wasn't going to do that stuff, I don't think. I mean, you know, he could have. He, he could have just simple game theory says he could have pushed it through, could have used the bully pulpit of the presidency. And so, yeah, I guess that's a credit to your point. It's not because it wasn't a consensus idea, you know, like that's not why. Anyway, axe grinding, millennial axe grinding, would really like some health care. <laughs> yeah, right. Same. I really need it. We haven't really talked too much about what this meant for Shangarnier. Kyle, what what is what does all this mean for Shangarnier? Oh well, he's sided with a spineless parliament and assumed that he has a kind of charismatic power over the army. But in terms of the both the the law and the actual state of play, thanks to Napoleon's sausages, that's he a, that's really does. Yeah, remember the picnics and the sausages where Napoleon was buying off the soldiers? I know, but it sounds uh, like he was boning them all in the barracks. Well, you know, I, I got no problem with that. 
if if that swayed the troops, then all power to him. Fair enough. Uh, all power. Fair play. <laughs> <laughs> Must be some bone. Yeah. Uh, so um, essentially, Shaw Gardier neither has like power on paper nor actual power over the military, which he assumes he has, and for some reason has deluded himself into thinking having the support of Parliament means anything when they are spineless and largely discredited. Okay, um, Puya, let's have a go at the next little bit. Are you ready? Okay, that same evening, the ministers were summoned to the Elysee. Bonaparte insisted on the dismissal of a Shang Garnier. Five ministers refused to sign. The Monitor announces a ministerial crisis, and the... Um, press of the party of order threatens to form a parliamentary army under the Shen Garnier's command. The party of order had a constitutional authority to take this step. It merely had to appoint Shen Garnier president of a national assembly and requisition any number of troops it pleased for its protection. It could do so all the more safely as uh, Shen Garnier still actually stood at the head of the army of, and the Paris National Guard and was only waiting to be requisitioned together with the army. The Bonapartist press did not yet even dare question the right of the National Assembly to requisition troops directly, a legal scruple that in the given circumstances did not look promising. The army would have obeyed the order of a National Assembly it is probable when one bears in mind that the Bonaparte had to search all of Paris for eight days in order, finally, to find two generals, who declared themselves ready to co-sign Shane Garnier's dismissal. The party of order, however, would have found its own ranks in the parliament. The necessary number of votes for such resolution is more than doubtful. When one considers that eight days later, 286 votes detach themselves from the party, and in December 1851, at the last hour of decision, the, the Montaigne still rejected a similar proposal. Nevertheless, the Burgraves might perhaps still have succeeded in spurring masses of their party to a heroism that consists, consisted in feeling themselves secure behind a force of bayonets and accepting the services of an army that had deserted to their camp. Instead of this, on the evening of January 6, the Burgraves uh, betook themselves to the Elysee to make Bonaparte desist from uh, dismissing Chen Garnier by using statesmanlike phrases and urging considerations of the state. Whomever one would seek to persuade, one acknowledges as a master of the situation. On January 12th, Bonaparte, assured by the step, appoints a new ministry in which the leaders of the old ministry remain. Uh, Saint Jean d'Angli would become war minister. The Monitor publishes the decree dismissing Chen Garnier commanded is divided between Baraguay de Hillers, who receives the 1st Army Division, and Perrault, who receives the National Guard. The bulwark of society has been discharged, and while this did not cause any tiles to fall from the roofs, quotations on the bourse are, on the other hand, going up. Okay, so Shangarnier is dead. <laughs> oh, he's not dead. But, like, his power is gone. And like what what's very interesting here is that while the party of order could have actually technically legally and probably poli probably politically if they had been able to get the vote through to do this to to make Jean Garnier the president of the national assembly and let him raise his own army it would have succeeded but the thing is at this stage the party of order had so weakened their own party by their shenanigans and their inability to to be decisive at the right times and their ability to be decisive at the wrong times, it, their party order was starting to fall apart and they were leeching people from the party of order into the Bonapartist camp. And so they would probably would have found it difficult to even get that vote through, which it shows you all the shenanigans that they've done, all their base, essentially, the bourgeoisie base are actually... At this moment, they're starting to slowly disintegrate and go towards Napoleon. And finance capital has been supportive of Bonaparte up until this point, And they're thrilled that Sean Garnier is out and Bonaparte's on the up. For me, this it shows the dynamics in kind of political disintegration. 
that people think that they have all the power, but really underneath that, there is lots of things shifting. And when the push comes to the shove, when real things need to be done, we see where the, the political power is. Like like when Trump ordered the, the troops onto the streets and the army kind of went, and uh, uh, no, lads, no, we're not going to do that. It seems to have taken, a no, I don't know from what it's like over there, but from from over here, like that decision seems to have really kind of like, what's that expression? Not to cut the legs from underneath him. Pulled really, the rug out from under him. It has a bit. Like, what does it feel like over there? Has that pulled the rug out of the idea as the president being the primary political function in America to some extent from like a, a real unitary power? I mean, I don't, I don't know if it's, done that damage to the institution, but it certainly makes Trump seem like the paper tiger that he's, he is. What it makes me think in particular is that all the kind of people freaking out and thinking that Trump's going to try to like do a coup, he clearly just can't, even if he wanted to. And I don't think that was ever really in the cards, but people talk that way. He doesn't have the legitimacy to pull that off, even within like the top brass. And honestly, that was part of his appeal is that he didn't have the legitimacy of the of the state <laughs> rip but in this situation like the loyalty of the state is more bifurcated because you know sausages <laughs> sausage metaphysics are moving the world the physicists thought the universe was a was a torus shaped like for like a donut for the cops but actually it's like a sausage for bonaparte oh there saying. we go there we go that's that's some marxism right there is it actually donut shaped? <laughs> I don't think don't it is. Don't start, Pooh, You don't fucking start. We're not going to start <laughs> talking about thermodynamics. I Sometimes think it's started for. A, I think it's going out. It's the sauce that's going through a donut. <laughs> that's what I heard. I mean, I don't know about space or anything, but I heard what? that it's going out. I do. I do just want to note the line: "Whomever one seeks to persuade, one acknowledges as master of the situation." That's that's a, that's some good stuff there. That's a brilliant point. That, that, that is like a dictum that you should bear in mind in life and in politics. That really stood out to me. Like, you know, what, what also strikes me about the current movement going on in America is that they're not going to the politicians looking for stuff because it seems some, I don't know, maybe it's like that people have copped on to some extent that, that that's not an effective I don't know. Maybe that. Maybe that because the politicians are losing legitimacy, your people are going fuck the politicians. The political system is all a load of rubbish. We're going out in the streets and we're going to do it for ourselves. Like I think there's an element of that. Do you think anybody think I'm going over the top of that? No, no, that's definitely true. I think there's like regular people being like, I got my Mao book in the mail. Like we're going to be fighting in the streets. Let's join the SRA. Have you been going as really like the protests and whatnot? Just been moving. I, I have, uh, I definitely have uh, communization FOMO. I'll put it that way. I've, but even... I've been to one of them, and yeah, it's it's pretty inspiring. I would say it's, I haven't been seeing like regular people ro- ro- rolling around with their uh, SRA card member, club member card, and their Mao book, red little red book. But I went to like I think somebody mentioned that some of these are um, kind of like festivals, right? And I actually like went to one of those. And, like, they're organizing there. <laughs> what do they do? They just play, like, music and have kind of people... I mean, if you're not, like, theory ahead, you know, you just want to be able to go somewhere where you can, you know, just listen to music and hang out and talk to people that you agree with politically. And, like, they're kind of drawing on these people. Are you referring to... What, what are you referring to specifically? Was, are you referring to Chaz? So, sounds like Chaz. No, no, no. Just in my area. SRA. SRA. Yeah, like no, they're, they're just nothing wrong with like doing like a hangout kind of like. Yeah. It doesn't have to be like super rad protest, yeah. march, looting, rioting all the time. Lefty block like, party. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what they're having, and they have like, and then it's like the SRA is there, and like the IWW is there, and and they and like there's regular people being like, yeah, I'm trying. I want. I want to join the SRA, and like. I just ordered my first Mao book in the mail. <laughs> well, they're well on the path to not being regular people, then, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're on their path to being disillusioned within fucking four months. Or or they're like, uh, I want to join a militia. They don't say I want to join the SRA, but they say, like, I wanna, I wanna, we, need to get, we need to get organized. And like, we need to get, 
I got my first Bible. <laughs> there's oh, there's somebody doing that yesterday. It was like so funny. Yeah. <laughs> we do black militias. First thing on is kids being born. That's something I, I guess. <laughs> no, it was really nice. I don't. I, I mean, okay. maybe the mouth. Maybe the mouth thing was like okay. That's not TC. Like was that theoretically correct? But like. <laughs> TC, you know, yeah. high, highly ironic usage of politically correct, but continue like it. <laughs> yeah, well, it's not exactly TC, but you know, it's not theoretically correct, but it's it's it's, it's fine. <laughs> it's yeah, really nice. No, I hear you, uh, Kyle. Yeah. I, I want to just echo that usage of the dictum. You know, who you seek to persuade, you acknowledge as master. It does make me, you know, reconsider orienting towards the different nerds. You know, towards the the STEM kind of like STEM Marxists and stuff. What do you mean by that, Ezri? Oh, because, you know, broadly speaking, I think Marxism, look, like people don't need Marxism to do proletarian self-activity. You know, you formulate Marxist theory for the most part for other Marxists. And like, I don't really think Marxists are generally the, like the sort of organic Marxists that tend to pop up they tend not to be the highest quality thinkers and I would like to see better Marxists out there. So my persuasion axis is more towards persuading like STEM types towards Marxism and, and talking to them. I think that has more to do with what I think I'm equipped for than who I acknowledge as master of the situation. But all the same, I mean, Daddy Marx said something, so I have to chew on it. Do you want to try this last paragraph for tonight? By repulsing the army, which places itself in the person of Shangarnier at its disposal, and so surrendering the army irrevocably to the president, the party of order declares that the bourgeoisie has forfeited its vocation to rule. A parliamentary ministry no longer existed. Having now indeed lost its grip on the army and the National Guard, what forcible means remain to it with which simultaneously to maintain the usurped authority of parliament over the people and its constitutional authority against the president. None. Only the appeal to impotent principles remains to it now, to principles that it had itself always interpreted merely as general rules, which one prescribes for others in order to be able to move all the more freely oneself. The dismissal of Jean Garnier and the falling of the military power into Bonaparte's hands closes this first part of the period we're considering, the period of struggle between the party of order and the executive power. War between the two powers has now been openly declared, is openly waged, but only after the party of order has lost both arms and soldiers. Without the ministry, without the army, without the people, without public opinion, after its electoral law of May, 31st, no longer the representative of the sovereign nation, sans eyes, sans ears, sans teeth, sans everything. The National Assembly had undergone a gradual transformation into an ancient French parliament that has to leave action to the government and content itself with growling remonstrances post festum, which means belatedly. Yep. So this is the way democracy dies with thunderous applause. <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful so beautiful <laughs> china no i i think this is i think this is the sort of a decisive like breaking point this is what marx is saying this is what you know one is ultimately worried about in a sort of electoral systems crisis we, we can you know forego calling it democracy because i mean it's not even really it's just like bourgeois representatives like slowly like whittling away the power of the party of order the executive power taking over what you know is it's supposed to be bourgeois state machinery but the bourgeoisie eventually turn on their own sort of party in a sense it's hard to just chalk it up to the bourgeoisie i guess there are these like aristocratic elements, but a lot of those aristocratic elements, you know, were, were very far or, you know, maybe in the grand historical scheme, not so far, but like generationally speaking, we're, you know, we're not dealing with the ancien regime anymore. We're dealing with the more bourgeois-fied forms of these aristocracies. 
you know, the classical party of order is overcome by the executive power. I think it's great because Marx really does like call back to what he has established at the in the in the early sections of this text, where he talks about the way in which the laws the parliament passed were so equivocal and the bourgeois liberties were so equivocal. And, you know, he just keeps hammering that through the text. And then now we see, oh, yeah, when you do that consistently, no one's going to stand up and defend you because you're just constantly saying, do as I say, not as I do. I mean, we would think of this in terms of like, I don't know, bourgeoisie, like, you know, electing Hitler or something. But it, this is so much further than that, because even the prospect of like elections or something or even the trimmings of universal manhood suffrage, you know, which is a funny category if there ever was one. You know, that stuff has already been stripped away by now. And we're getting to the bare bones of the, of the power relations here beneath the, you know, legal superstructure, you might say. This is the power relations underneath, you know, showing you what those laws and principles that, yeah, Marx is uh, quite right in saying that, look, you, you write those laws and principles or whatever to constrain other people's behavior, not yours. And if that's all you have to keep the political situation together, expect the power relations to overcome that shit. Damn straight. Is damn, is damn straight now, is that like a politically incorrect thing to say? I've never thought about it. Yeah, I'm cancelling you as we speak. I'm on Twitter Ah, right now. God damn it. <laughs> I can't, I, I don't know what else to say. All, all I'm saying is that I don't want to, like, offend the straight community or something. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm just using it as a metaphor. No, no, I, I, I think it's, like, damn straight people, so... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so that's I think funny. you're in the clear. I think you're in the clear. Turned it on its head. <laughs> Jesus, that was that was good. Peter. That was like the, one of those last lines he does in every paragraph where he throws the thing on his head instead of being damned straight. It was damned the straight. <laughs> oh God, we're reading too much marks here. Okay, uh, I think we've got enough done for today. If anybody has else anything to say about this paragraph before we rattle our Something. I don't know what I was going to say. Sucks to suck, party of order. That is correct. Uh, I think we we mm -hmm. wish them farewell. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. I don't know why it reminds me of a, of a joke. It's, it's not related at all, but I tell it because it's a funny one. Do people know that in Ireland there's no snakes? Does anybody yeah, know that? Yeah, of course, of course. Huh. Yeah. The legend is that St. Patrick, he got rid of them. He drove all the snakes out of Ireland. Right, so that's... That, so that's the setup for the joke. It's like, what did what did Saint Patrick say when he was driving the snakes out of Ireland? What? Uh, are you all right there in the back, lads? <laughs> oh, Tom. <laughs> what? what? <laughs> and, like in the back of the car because he was driving <laughs> them out of <laughs> Ireland. <laughs> Oh, oh boy, <laughs> that was a dad joke, Tom. <laughs> gone from, wasn't gone from the the high quality marks. We've got we've gone from the 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 low quality marks to the high quality marks to the dad joke. Uh, <laughs> that is one of my favorite jokes. Wait, wait, wait. What what did the big bucket say to the little bucket? What? Looking a little pale. There we go. I have another one. Another one of my favorite ones is like, did you hear the the carrot died? The, there was a big turnip at the funeral. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right, let's go off off stream. <laughs> On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. 
you can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science and Swampside Chats. Thank you.